I was actually thinking about this today. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking about cleanliness because you know it's, you know when we give dawah to, um, dawah meaning like we give an invitation to non-Muslims to to look at Islam and to kind of be educated on it and become Muslim even. Um, when we do that, we we usually give very um, formulaic type evidences. Or uh, you know yeah. the Quran says this and it makes these predictions, and I'm I'm guilty of this more than anyone else. I'll do this myself. But you know, subhanAllah, you know one easy thing to kind of identify is that it's, first and foremost, Islam is a religion which aims to be all-encompassing in so much as that it, it, it actually attempts to be an answer for every little thing. We talked about sexual intercourse before and there's actually guidelines on how to pleasure a woman from a male perspective. There's guidelines on how to, <laughs> there is guidelines on how to, this is how deep it gets. One guy came to Salman al-Farisi uh, Salman al farisi is one of the Sahaba and, he's, and he, said, um, he said to him Does your Prophet tell the people how to clean themselves after using the toilet? Oh, yeah. And he said yeah and, and he told them how the Prophet gave us guidance on that <coughs> The point is Islam aims to be a comprehensive religion In terms of purity and, and being clean There are two kinds of purity Once again we we'll go to our dichotomy Yeah, There's a spiritual Could you please de de uh, define dichotomy? It's like a dualism right? Listen, <laughs> 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 so, so it's like uh, yeah, two, is, uh, two is, things. Okay, fine. Right. So here, on the one hand, we have a spiritual purity, okay. which is the most important, and all the prophets <coughs> came to purify people in a spiritual way. Okay. And the Quran is mentioning uh, mentions that you know uh, that Abraham made dua for someone to come afterwards, that he purifies them. And he teaches them the Quran, the Kitab, and the Hikmah, which is the Sunnah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is referred to in Surah Al Jumu'ah, chapter sixty-two of the Quran, is that wa yuzakihim wa yalimu al Kitab wa al Hikmah. He he is purifies them. So purification in chapter ninety-one of the Quran, Surah Al Surah Al Shams, says Qad aflah man zakaha. The one who has purified himself has already succeeded. So from a spiritual perspective. This idea of purification. Now the thing is, I, I put to you this, and I know Hamza, I might do another inshallah with him. I'm gonna do a, a discussion with him on consciousness and first person subjective consciousness, all these kind of things. But I put to you guys, and I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna format this as a kind of uh, thought exercise, yeah? Okay. And this is actually experiential. This is not a deduction type argument. It's a thought experiment. It's kind of like based on your experience, yeah? Okay. I put to you guys that human beings have an innate inclination to that which is clean. I'd agree with that completely. Yeah, from your experience, I think most people in the world would agree that cleanliness attracts human beings. Now, Definitely. actually from a biological or even evolutionary perspective, there's no reason for that to be always the case. Okay. There's no reason for us to prefer nice smells, for example, or nice, beautiful things. Yeah, like a sunset or something. There's no... Uh, Biological advantage It doesn't help us survive It doesn't actually help us survive okay. So from that perspective The question is Why do we like things That sound And that like, look beautiful And that are actually clean Why are we more content Being clean And why did the prophets According to the Islamic narrative Come to clean people Both spiritually and physically Bear that in mind Whilst I tell you That actually There's very specific guidelines In Islam On how to be spiritually pure <coughs> And how to be physically pure and you might, you might think, well, so what? It's common sense to be clean. That what someone might say. Is it really common sense? Look, historically, and I was thinking about this. In this country, the UK, yep. which, was the, which was the house of the Industrial Revolution. It was the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1760. It, you know, Britain started a lot of things, right? And because of the age of discovery and all these kind of things, Britain was at the top of um, technological development and achievement in uh, in what you call the um, early modern period, after the medieval period, yeah? Yeah. So, in England, in Britain, it was not known that cleaning your hands and washing your hands, okay, prevented germs until 1895, where Louis Pasteur came and that's why, the, by, the way, by the way, where pasteurized milk comes from. Really? He, yeah, yeah. He came and he said that, you know, he invented something called germ theory. Germ theory where basically germs cause diseases. In this country, in the Industrial Revolution, people were dying at a very early age because they didn't even know washing your hands 
prevents these things, prevents, for example, infections, it prevents diseases. Now, I want you to consider that when you're thinking about, subhanAllah, the fact that we've had wudu from 1,400 years. <coughs> Think about that. We had wudu every time, well, you had to do wudu at least once a day because you had to pray at least once. Uh, you had to pray with one wudu once a day. Yani once a day. You have to pray five times a day with one wudu. At least one wudu. You have to do ghusl, which is you have to wash your whole body. Yeah. If you had sexual intercourse, if your, sorry, I'm explicitly, if your penis met the, the top, top of your penis met the, 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 the tip of a vagina, not even penetration. You have to do wudu. Okay. Uh, you have to do ghusl, sorry. If a woman has finished her menstruation, she has to do ghusl. She has to do, she has to wash her whole body. Uh, if a man had a wet dream and he ejaculated or he masturbated and it's haram, but he, he, he had a shower, he has to have a shower. Or a woman, same thing. So there are, there are limited things that you have to have a shower because of. Right. In this country, people were not having showers on a regular basis until well after the World War I. Uh, it's a recent phenomena for Europeans and especially <coughs> British European people to be hygienic in that sense, to right. wash their hands, to uh, to have showers. Seriously, is what it? What about even using water after visiting the toilet? They don't even do that now. Right. And you know, it's, you'll find that, subhanAllah, yeah, to, guys, I and mean, this is not to d depreciate from anyone's cultural heritage, yeah, but just like the Muslims, I mean, we had this, like, for example, of toothbrush. Think about this, toothbrush. Yeah. When did toothbrush become popular in the UK? Let's answer that question. Bristles and a toothbrush. It did not become popular until probably after World War, World War I. It wasn't really that popular before. Brushing your teeth was not a popular thing. In the hadith, uh, narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, yeah? the Prophet Muhammad says, لو لا أشق على أمتي لا أمرتهم بسواك بالسواك عند كل صلاة He said that if it wasn't for that it would be difficult on my ummah. I would have told them to brush their teeth on every salah. Now the word siwak, some people will think is that stick, yeah. which is actually a miswak, but siwak is an Arabic verb. He, he cleaned his teeth. So you can do it. I, I believe the Prophet Muhammad would have loved the toothbrush because you can do siwak with it. Yeah. So siwak is not necessarily just with miswak. Miswak is, the, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is an ism, which means it's a noun. It's talking about the stick. But siwak is a fi'al, is a, is a verb. So it could be talking about the process of cleaning your teeth. So the Islamic recommendation is to brush your teeth five times a day. That's not even adhered to, it's not even the dental uh, thing. In this country, they say, okay. He said, لَوْ لَا أَشُقْ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي لَا أَمَرْتُمْ بِالسِّوَاكِ عَنْدَ كُرُوا صَلَاةٍ That I would have told them to brush their teeth. Yani uh, washing, having a shower, uh, doing wudu, washing, yani uh, the, the ayah of wudu, washing your hands and your face and your feet. There are certain things we do now that other cultures are not, they're not aware that we do. For example, الاستنثار, putting water into the nose. استنشاق uh, Taking it out of the nose You know A lot of people that become Muslim They don't go through that process Where they're cleaning their sinus cavity Because it, it's not something Which occurs to them That I need to clean This area Inside the nose We have to do that every day uh, Cleaning the ears Obviously it's, it's, It is culturally acceptable now to clean, And it's, it's sometimes encouraged To clean the ears At least the peripheral area um, You were talking about Cleaning yourself properly After you You do uh, You excrete Basically and there's, a, there's an Islamic Number prescribed. Two. Yeah, so Anas ibn Malik, he noted a hadith that you have to get rid of everything in terms of the, the, the excrement. So the Islamic standard for cleanliness, I would argue, is more than any other religion in the world. And in fact, higher than the cultural ac accepted norm in, in the Western world. And, you know, subhanAllah, there's many hadith that say, for example, al-fitratu khams, al-fitratu ashar, that the fitra is five things. For example, one of them says fitra to khams, al fitra to khams. The, the fitra is five things that you have to trim the uh, the moustache and uh, and you have to shave the pubic hair and cutting the nails and these things. There are some religions which actually say you're not allowed to shave your pubic hair. Imagine a woman or a man, imagine a woman or a man having to live a full life without shaving the underarm hair or shaving the the, the hair on the navel. For a woman or a man, that would be quite a disastrous thing. And even from a hygienic perspective, you couldn't argue that's hygienic. You couldn't argue that's clean. Mm. Some religions, it's composed. You can't actually take a hair, a single pubic hair away. In Islam, it, there's very specific guidelines on you have, to, you have to clean yourself in that way. You have to cut your nails, you know. So I feel, and you know, subhanAllah, they've made some research on the beard recently. 
obviously the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu he said قص الشارب أوف اللحى وقص الشارب وخالف اليهود النصارى that trim the mustache he was talking about trim the mustache yeah and and let the beard grow and uh, and basically dis- differentiate yourself distinguish yourself from the Jews and the Christians and في رواية وخالف المجوس the Medians the point being that they, they, they found something recent uh, things like it has some uh, properties the beard actually has some properties which protects your face from certain conditions and stuff really sure you've seen it yes subhanallah so anyways the point being is this is that it takes the west a long time to get to the same stage as we were talking about 1400 years ago basic things like washing your hands and having a shower which for us is so commonsensical it was not commonsensical for the british man until you know after the world war <coughs> it was not commonsensical for them So they have had to wait a long time To get to where we were a long time ago When they talk about barbarism and backwardness That's what the things they have to kind of consider Islam gave us cleanliness But if, you're, if they were impressed by the toothbrush And washing yourself They'd be even more impressed with the spiritual kind of cleanliness That Islam gives Because wallahi, wow. if they knew about What Islam actually provides In terms of purif- purification of the heart And soul and mind Everyone, they'll be fighting us with the swords. SubhanAllah. As the famous person said, they would have fought us with the, their swords. But anyways, th- this is something which we, we give as a... Because the thing is, the human project is a, is a project which, as Plato would say, is divisible into three different things, the mind, body, and the soul. And all the things that have to be... Um, if, you wanna, if you want to satisfy yourself in all three, and you'll be content as a human being, you have to satisfy these three spheres. The Western world... Makes you gives you that illusion of okay you're satisfied but it doesn't actually give you any solutions. It's an illusion with no solution. Islam is really very very practical, and and the evidence of that is that most of the things which we deem commonsensical because it actually appeals to our first person subjective experience like cleanliness and purity, that Islam prescribed basic solutions for a thousand four hundred years ago to wash yourself to clean yourself. Water is tahir or tahur is purifier <coughs> and it purifies. For example. 